Today we are going to talk about a drink that called QQ Milky Milky Extremely Delicious to the point that may put tea or bubble tea or boba tea depending on where you live. As you might have noticed, the drink is outrageously flamboyant. But you know what is also flamboyant? Boba liberalism. But what is it? Let's find out with people also ask. <laughs> Now, welcome to What People Also Act, where I search something seemingly obvious on Google and share with you some of those pop, aka People Also Act, which is a feature telling you what other people are searching on Google that related to your query. Today, I want to talk about a drink that is very, very famous in Taiwan called boba tea or bubble tea. And I will tell you why it also called QQ Milky Milky Extremely Delicious to the point that made tea at the end of the video. So, obviously, we have to first talk about what is it with our first pop. What is bubble tea made out of? Which is published by, let me check my note, which is actually scripted, you know, it's all scripted. The, the answer is extracted from an article titled Make Boba for Bubble Tea, published by Scientific American, which is the oldest continuously published monthly popular science magazine in the United States, founded by inventor and publisher Rufus M. Porter in 1845. According to this article, boba tea or bubble tea is a sweetened drink made of flavored tea, milk, and bubbles, aka boba which is a definition I, as a Taiwanese, approve of. According to this article, the translucent squishy bubble cold boba are very easy to make. You only need three ingredients, tapioca flour, water, and brown sugar. This article provides a child-friendly recipe for boba making. It also shares some interesting scientific fun facts that I have never thought of. Fun fact 1. Unlike wheat flour, which contains starches, protein, and fiber, tapioca flour contains only starch. No wonder it's so chewy. Fun fact 2. Tapioca flour behaves differently in hot and cold water. Starch particles are created when a large number of glucose units are joined together. When these particles are mixed with cold water, they disperse and float around in the water, but the particles do not change. When you leave a mixture out, the water will eventually evaporate, and you will have your starch particles again. However, starch particles swell and break apart when mixed with hot water. The smaller pieces then create new connections and form a network that can hold water. The process is called starch gelatinization. When this solution cools, it becomes more gel-like. With time, it will lose water and become stiffer. But no matter how long you wait, it will not turn into starch particles again. And understand this, it's very important when you try to make boba, because if you use the wrong temperature of water at the wrong time, then you won't get your boba whatsoever. Since we already talked about some science about boba, I think it's a good time that we also learn some history about it, like who invented boba, which is the next part we are gonna talk about. The answer of this question is extracted from an article titled Boba Tea, How Did It Start? published by CNN Travel. According to this article, it happened in 1988. One day, a product development manager in Chen Shuitang Tea House, Lin Shouhui sitting in a staff meeting and had brought with her a typical Taiwanese dessert called Fen Yun, which is a sweetened tapioca pudding. Just for fun, he poured the tapioca balls into the essence and iced tea and drank it. Everyone at the meeting loved the drink and it quickly outsold all of their other iced tea within a couple of months. Soon bubble tea makes up 80 to 90 percent of their sales ever seen. I'm not surprised because it's super addictive, but why is boba tea addictive? Which is the next part we are gonna talk about. The answer is extracted from an article titled The Main Reason Why Bubble Tea is Addictive is Not Due to the Burrows, published by the goodyfeed.com, which is a Singapore online magazine. I just read their about page, it sounds like a, like a Singapore version of BuzzFeed. According to this article, the main reason that bubble tea is addictive is the caffeine in the tea. I want to say I do not agree with the thesis of this article because if that is the case, the sales of Chen Shui Tang Tea House should be evenly distributed to all caffeinated drinks, right? It won't like bubble tea make out of 80 to 90 percent of their sales. I give kudos to this article because it did point out how much caffeine you can potentially ingest by drinking bubble tea. It cited statistics from caffeineinformer.com in which they tested 10 samples of boba tea. The amount of caffeine in each cup is about 100 to 160 milligrams, averaged out to about 130 milligrams per cup. To put it into perspective, some coffee only have about 100 milligrams per cup. So you can potentially drink more caffeine by drinking bubble tea compared to drinking coffee. Well, that short is crazy, but it won't kill you, right? Let's talk about another two parts. Can tapioca pros kill you? And does tapioca contain cyanide? 
the first time I saw this product on Google search, I was like, what a dumb question. Does tapioca contain cyanide? Give me a break. But then I realized I was being ignorant by assuming people asking this question out of ignorance. No question is a dumb question. And people ask this question on Google is that tapioca that we use are a refined product of cassava, which indeed contains cyanide precursor. So the answer to this question is extracted from an article titled Tapioca and Cyanide, published by todayifoundout.com, which is a derivative website from a YouTube channel based on the idea that you should try to learn something new every day, called Today I Find Out. According to this article, cassava can be split into two general classifications, sweet and bitter. Although both contain cyanogenic glycoside, which are chemical compounds contained in food that release hydrogen cyanide when digested by humans, Bitter cassava may have as much as 400 mg of cyanogenic glycoside per kilo, potentially 8 times more toxic than sweet cassava. But as a bull body drinker, you actually don't need to worry about it too much. As it turns out, cyanogenic glycoside are always present in a startling number of plants cultivated for human consumption. That include almond, lima bean, and cassava. We don't get sick from eating those products because by the time they reach us, the toxin has been eliminated. Eating great cassava, for example, usually has been properly treated in a labor-intensive process that may include roasting, soaking, or fermentation. So by the time we get to eat it, a cyanide content is negligible. Alright, so boba is not that bad. But you know what is bad? Boba liberalism! But what is that? Which is the next path we are gonna talk about? The answer to this question is extracted from an article titled um, The Rise and Stole of Boba Generation, published by Eater, which is a food and dining website owned by Vox Media. This is a very long article started off by elaborately discussing the cultural significance of boba tea to the Asian community. Then the author goes on to explain how boba tea and food porn in general has become a symbol of Asian Americans to rectify their perceived differences in Western countries. So, so the concept is like, you might not like some aspect of my culture but like who can hate boba tea everyone loves it but this kind of tendency to pursue more positive representation uh, in mainstream media by highlighting the more western friendly aspect of asian culture while selectively ignore other ethnic issues is criticized by some uh, activists in asian community they call this kind of activism boba liberalism because it's like boba tea a lot of sugar a lot of calorie but no nutrition no substances for example, while some Asian Americans appraise the Asian representation in Crazy Rich Asian, the critics of boba liberalism tend to think the film is a bad representation because it selectively highlights the lifestyle of middle and higher class Asian population and to some degree reinforce the model minority myth. Another criticism of boba liberalism is that if you focus on chasing the positive representation of your home country or your country of origin, you might be reluctant to speak out to other social issues of your home country like poverty and in some case human rights infringement. You might even try to suppress the negative coverage of your home country just because you don't want your home country's image being hurt. We all know that happened. If you want to learn more about boba liberalism, I include a lot of further reading in the description. Very interesting concept. At the end of the video, I want to explain why some Taiwanese start calling boba tea kukumuki muki extremely delicious to the point that maple tea. That's because if you haven't noticed yet, recent year a lot of um, boba tea houses in Taiwan are trying to be clever about naming their drink. And sometimes it can be very annoying because now when you go to the boba shop and look at the menu, you probably can't tell what are they selling anymore. In response, a Taiwanese comedian Joseph made a video making fun of this situation by calling bubble tea QQ Milky Milky extremely delicious to the point that maple tea and a lot of Taiwanese started calling boba tea that name everything. I put a link in the description. It's really funny. Anyway, see you later!